it's going to be a great car for the ride hail and the robo taxi mm -hmm. application. And so when you do have a group of people that want to go together, that is going to be clearly a much better platform for that ride. So we've got uh, Japan. To start off with that. Test this beginning testing FSE supervised in Japan. It's going to be F employees first, but they do have plans to roll that out via software update to the existing cars. This is the article that was written, basically saying that uh, first of all, employees test drive and check the performance, aiming for early practical use. The software update is also introduced to vehicles that have me sold. This is a <laughs> the translation wasn't perfect. Uh, what's your thinking about um, what they're doing in Japan? Well, this is just one more example of Tesla's push to start opening up as many markets around the world to their self-driving technology as possible. Obviously, one of the big hurdles that Tesla is going to face in their road to a world where you know autonomous ride hail robo taxis are ubiquitous is going to be regulatory hurdles. And so this is them interfacing with those. Um, we do need to see more of this. It's great to see Tesla continuing to actually do this, not only there in Japan, but obviously we've seen lots of different announcements around uh, Europe and in other countries in Asia as well. Um, so it's great to see that advance and move forward. And it is something for people to watch because I think this is going to be one of those things that at different points will be bottlenecks in the expansion of Tesla's overall business line, their margins, um, and their ability to bring this critical technology that so many of us need. We'll talk about that more later in the show. Uh, but yeah, incredible transportation at an incredible price. Um, that opens up possibilities for people that didn't exist before. We are bringing, you know, technology yeah. that allows us to have cheaper, better, faster to the transport ecosystem overall. And we want this to be as accessible to as many people around the world as possible. Tesla's obviously got the scale to be able to deliver vehicles all across the world in a very short period of time. And so having the markets opened up and having the regulator or the regulators be able to allow that technology to be in use for their citizens yeah. is gonna be very important. I think that's the point. I think that uh, people are not, um, are, are realizing now that regulators actually want FSD and they're bringing it in as opposed to saying, no, here's Japan, we got Australia, we got Europe. We're gonna see more of this happening more. But uh, another big good sign that happened here is Tesla is starting to re recruit uh, more employees in South Korea. Um, look at the jobs that they have available in the, all these different areas, by the way. But uh, yeah, the, why is this is important? South, South Korea is the fourth largest country in vehicle sales, expect, in, if you look at the first half of this year, for example, but in general. So the potential is great. Demand is increasing. Thoughts on South Korea? Yep. This is you know, a different format, but you know, the same overall general trend that there's going to be different specific requirements that regulators have in each different geography. And then every different geography is going to be at a different point in an overall similar process that starts with, you're not even allowed to use FSD in this country to actually now you can have autonomous mm -hmm. ride hail robo taxis. Um, and so South Korea is a little bit further down the road than Japan is, which is excellent. It is like you mentioned, it's the fourth largest car market for Tesla um, in the world. And so, you know, once we have the United States and China taking care of, then South Korea is pretty high on the list. I would guess that Japan is maybe, or yeah, probably Japan is number three behind the United States and China. If Japan is number three, then I would say South Korea is the the third most yeah. important thing for them to move forward because of the, the roadblocks that they're probably going to encounter yeah. in Japan. All right, we've got uh, this interesting, more and more analysts, and this guy, Jed Dorsheimer from William Blair, he tested Tesla's robo-taxi last week in Austin, and boy, look at the words he's using here, very, very positive. So we experienced a glimpse of the future, and it's exciting. The comparisons are, uh, comparisons are immediate and stark. When we drove past Waymo and Zook's vehicles outfitted with their complex sensor suite, they stuck out like a sore thumb. In contrast, the robo-taxis blended in with other Teslas on the road, we felt inconspicuous flowing with the traffic. Confirming our thesis, RoboTaxi was half the price of Uber, showing its ability to win market share by weaponizing the price. Okay. <laughs> in Austin, we took multiple RoboTaxi and Waymo rides. Contrast was clear. Aside from the visual difference, 
you know, pulling up to the curb, the robot taxi was comfortable and familiar. Driving was smooth and human-like, patiently waiting to execute a safe and protected turn, not to slam on the brakes, those kind of things. Uh, Waymo also provided a top-notch service, and we did not encounter any safety concerns. But if we were to be overly critical, it felt more robotic. In the cabin, you have to listen to an airline preamble and Waymo safety protocols. During the ride, you can hear all the pre uh, the various spinning LiDAR sensors. So Robotaxi, more luxurious, half the cost, driving drives more like human, right? So they're, fu- you know, good on them for actually testing Robotaxi and then for them to realize these are the differences, yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear the same types of things that you and I have said about our experiences with the Robo Taxi and the Waymo, but you know, coming from the mouth of an actual analyst on Wall Street who has now done their own homework. Um, and it's good also that you know the network has expanded to allow these types of people to come down and experience it. That it's uh, you know not just the select early twenty riders that were there on the first day. So that's another important thing to track in all of this. And like I said, I I echo his statements that both Waymo and the RoboTaxi service are a far better experience than an Uber drive. Uh, So in my mind, they're worth a premium to Uber, but if you can actually get them for less than the price (laughs) of an Uber, then it's a double win. And, um, but yeah, I would say the RoboTaxi is superior to the Waymo in the dimensions of the feel of the, you know, the Model Y is just a more comfortable car to be inside of than the Jaguar I-Pace. That will change, you know, eventually as Waymo scales up. And I don't know how luxurious the next, you know, Hyundai Ioniq or um, Zeker, is Zeker the the one yeah. behind that, um, <laughs> are going to feel inside. But, you know, that's, that's a stark difference. And the really thing that's going to be important is they do have to be equivalent in the consumer's minds on safety Mm. that you don't really get to the point where you are prioritizing appearance and luxury feel and Mm human-like feel until you are comfortable with it being over a certain threshold of safety. And so this is true for both Tesla and Waymo. They have to execute on keeping the safety at the highest levels and managing the brand perception of safety overall in the eyes of the public. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's critical. Uh, The rest of it is great, but price is next, right? (laughs) Safety, price, what do you think? What are the, uh, how would you prioritize it? Safety, price, then probably the feel of the the driver. And, and like, I do think that those two things are close. I think that yeah. for the majority of people, when they get in the car, if they are, aren't doing back-to-back rides, that the Waymo and the Tesla will feel similar mm-hmm. enough. Um, so I don't think that's going to be a huge differentiating factor between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, that you do have to be paying attention to notice how the Waymo feels a little bit more robotic. And if you're in the car with someone else and you're just having a conversation, and you've gotten to the point where you feel comfortable with it overall, you're totally not going to notice it. It's just going to fade into the background. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the like I said, yeah, safety, price, the the luxury feel, availability is honestly probably the next thing. You know, what's right. the wait time? Right. Is yeah. can I get one where I want it? Can I get one when I want it? Can I go where I need to go? Um, yeah. And that's going to be a huge factor and also an area where if Tesla can scale up their fleet much faster than Waymo, where they'll have a clear advantage. I think the fourth one for me would be uh, personalization. The fact that when I walk into a, once I've used a Tesla Robotaxi in the past, or I have one happens to be, next Robotaxi I come in, it's everything's like set up the way I want it set up. The, apparently now they're using the seats or being moved too, based on what you did in the past. You can now, of course, have access to all your music and movies. I think that is like that feeling that this is my car, you know? We'll see. Yeah, that is going to be... Next. Important. Yeah. I do think Waymo can obviously do some of those things, but doing them in, you know, there's limited availability to do some of that customization in the iPace or the Hyundai Ionic compared to the model. Like some of that is the software that Tesla has. And I think mm-hmm. Waymo can replicate a lot of the software parts of that, but some of it is the hardware of the vehicle itself. And I think that's going to be much harder for Waymo to be able to match on. Okay. 
Another big thing that happened uh, just this morning is Model YL has now officially launched. We reported yesterday that uh, all the new information, but today we have even more of the price. We have videos, we have comparisons and reviews. So this is the price, um, $47,000. It's 339,000 won. Um, this is, so in, there was initial rumors it was gonna be over 55, and then it, then the rumors was 40,000, now it's 47,000. Uh, but the review signs, right? They're coming in very positive. This looks like it's going to be a big seller. Uh, what do you think? Well, I have to say that I love this configuration of the Model Y. I think this is definitely a much needed hole in the vehicle lineup that Tesla has had. You know, to be able to have this vehicle at this price point that there, you know, it's not exactly a Model X, um, but it gives you a significant fraction of the model x capabilities at a much much lower price so you know having the six seat configuration with the two captain seats in the rear makes this a better vehicle for a lot of families and i think that's going to be a huge seller i think it's going to work very well not only in china uh, but i expect us to get a similar variant here in the united states in the not too distant future uh, and i think it's going to sell like hotcakes i think this is going to be a big driver of incremental demand for Tesla vehicle sales overall. And I think this is a great uh, addition to the Tesla RoboTaxi fleet as well. Um, the, that the, seating the, configuration yeah. will probably be better as a Tesla RoboTaxi than the current Model Y for a lot of use cases. Yeah, absolutely. Did you see what he just said? He said that this is actually luxury. It's actually premium. And I, I think people are falling in love with a car now that they find out that it actually has more features of really, really thoughtful features. On, on a vehicle that, like we said, it's not huge, but Tesla's just so good about the economy of how they can create space and use space. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously it's not going to be the most comfortable that it could be for two adults in the back seat of that car, but that is way more room uh, in those back seats than the, the seven seat version of the Model Y that we had for a little while. Um, so it, it's just going to be a great car and the, the extra length in the chassis, you know, is part of what makes that possible. Um, but having captain seats for your second row instead of a bench um, is just a massive, massive difference in convenience, utility, functionality, and the overall, like you said, premium feel of the car. Hans, I was going to ask you though, do you think that they added all these new features? Just I mean, there was cup holders at the back. <laughs> they did this. Is it because it's in China, you know? Where with China, you're competing with all these other cars that has all it's like feature by, by feature to comparison. Or do you think that a lot of this will show up in the U.S. version? No, I expect the U.S. version to be very, very, very similar. And mm. obviously, we we love our cup holders here. Uh, we drive <laughs> long distances. True. Um, and, you know, we have consumers that have quite a bit of uh, disposable income at their beck and call uh, as well. So, yeah, I think that it will make sense to sell a car that is just as good, if not better, here in the United States compared to the one that is being sold in China. Um, and I actually expect that announcement to be made pretty soon. Sorry. Basically, as soon as uh, Q3 starts or potentially mm -hmm. even just before, like once they don't have to worry about uh, making this transition from the non-EV tax credit to, or you know, right now we have the EV tax credit to not having it next quarter. Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll hear about their plans to bring this to the United States very, very it's, soon. Yeah, yep. it's already August, so it's got to be like next month. Or yeah, two months the, very, the very end of September or the very beginning of October uh, wow. is when I'm expecting yep. to hear that. Okay. Huge seller in your mind here in the U.S.? Yeah, uh, huge seller, yes. What's your number? I was asking that same thing to Brian White to Jeff Lutz, they think 500, 500,000 maybe at scale. Easily, yeah. Yeah, I can see that um, globally. It should be at least, yeah, of just that variant. Yeah. Okay. Especially, you know, like I said, it, it's going to be a great car for the ride hail and the robo taxi mm -hmm. application. 
And so, you know, the majority of all of those cars are going to be cyber cabs, obviously, because the majority of rides are going to be the, the two seater, um, is going to be plenty for, especially with the room in the back. But when you do have a group of people that want to go together, that is going to be clearly a, a much better platform for that ride. And it's going to be more economical to get four to five to six people to the same place than doing two different cyber cabs uh, or three potentially. And yeah, that is going to drive, I think, quite a bit of demand over the long term as well, that it's not just going to be consumers and families, which, you know, that's going to be a, a significant portion of the, the sales of that vehicle, but also that ride hail use mm -hmm. case will drive additional unit sales as well. Oh, I think we're all, I, I think this is going to be a big winner.